All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Joanna Peters, co-chair with Marco Oropisa of the IERG Global Leadership Webinar Series. First of all, we have some announcements for the coming month. Tomorrow evening, the New York chapter is co-hosting with the Dutch Financial Club of New York, the chief economist of the Business Roundtable. Today is the last day to register and to join YAP, your New York chapter colleagues, and network with the Business Roundtable chief economist and the New York Dutch Financial Club. Tomorrow evening's venue is Baker McKenzie Law Firm, Midtown location, near Grand Central. Please look at the IERG calendar for location and sign up details. On Friday, the Connecticut chapter starts the new year with its breakfast networking series at 8 a.m. Also, every second Tuesday of the month, the Chicago chapter runs its networking mixer. For both events, see the IERG calendar for details. If you would like to post a short heads up 120 word article in the IERG newsletter, please email it to Peter Rumpe by January 20th. And finally, we ask you to cast your vote for the IERG board election. Email sent out Tuesdays starting January 3rd. Today, you will learn more about finding authentic high potential talents. Our distinguished speaker is Dr. Kim Rule, recommended by IERG Global Leadership Co-Chair and Board Member, Marco Oropisa. Kim is the President of Inventive Talent Management, and he is a Master Human Capitalist Strategist certified by the Human Capital Institute, and holds an Executive Certificate in the Applied Neuro Leadership Program at the Neuro Leadership Institute. For many years, Kim was Director of Learning and Development for Siemens and ran Global Research and Development at Corn Ferry Leadership and Talent Consulting, where he led the development of numerous robust talent management tools, assessments, and thought leadership. He has advised global firms, presented in numerous countries, published widely, and he is an acknowledged master in the human development, organizational development, general management, and board governance solution. We are very fortunate to have Kim present to us today. First, we ask that you hold your questions and mute your phones until the end of the presentation. This webinar is recorded, and the link will be available online at a later time. Over to you, Kim. Okay, thank you, Joanna. And uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. It's really a pleasure for me to be uh, with you today and to talk about a topic that I think is uh, uh, not only very important but kind of challenging. Um, when, you, when you speak to leaders and organizations, uh, even people that are in the HR function, which uh, those people should have a little bit more expertise in this area, there seems to be a, a big struggle in uh, identifying who are our true high potential uh, talent, who has the capability to move more quickly through their careers, advance to more senior levels, and eventually serve at the highest uh, leadership levels in our organization. So what I'd like to do to, uh, today is to talk to you about uh, how we can, what research says would really indicate, predicts potential, leadership potential, and some practical things uh, that might apply to your own career. So I start with a few questions here. Um, and if we were all together face to face, we might have this more of a conversation, but in, in interest of time, I'm gonna go through and kind of provide you my perspective and answers on some of these questions in terms of defining leadership potential and uh, addressing the difficulties of identifying potential. And then we'll get into the real predictors of potential. So the first question is, how do you define leadership potential? So um, leadership is really the ability to exercise influence to an intact group, a cohort of people. And the early research around leadership actually um, came 
through looking at how the military got armies to move. And so leadership is about movement. And uh, so we're not so interested in moving armies and maybe even not, not so interested in physical movement. But what we want to do is we want to influence an intact group uh, rather than just an individual. Because leadership is more than influencing an individual. It's, it's making a, a group make decisions to approach and avoid certain things, to exhibit certain behaviors, to make certain kinds of decisions. And so that's what leadership is. And potential, when we talk about potential, uh, we're really talking about the ability to learn and grow and enhance my contribution in the organization. And related to leadership then, it's the ability to learn and grow and the ability to influence intact groups. And well, we could say that everyone has some potential, everybody certainly has the potential to learn and grow and enhance their contribution. Not everybody has high potential. Not everybody can, can move uh, with the, the velocity through their career and go to the kind of levels that we're talking about with high potentials. So again, high potentials are people who uh, can move with a higher velocity through their career. They can take on uh, challenging, uh, assignments more quickly uh, and they can go to higher levels and and their terminal uh, position in the in the organization is likely to be a very senior organization one with a lot of responsibility so then the question is um, why do we have a hard time identifying the people who have that potential it should, it should seem like it's kind of intuitively obvious when we look at talent who has that ability but the truth of the matter is that um, most managers have a very difficult time separating performance and potential. And in fact, I would go so far to say that for most of us, uh, we, we really, it's, it, we're basically incapable of distinguishing those two things. And it, it's very important to understand that those are two different constructs. Performance is not the same thing as potential. So when <clears throat> performance overshadows our evaluation of people, people's current performance, um, it's going to make us probably it's going to result in quite a few false positives. We're going to identify people as having potential when the truth is they are stellar performers, outstanding performers, but are pro probably well-placed or have limited room for advancement. And in fact, if you uh, try to promote rapidly people who just based on ver uh, basis of their performance, you're likely to have people who, who derail or disappoint us when they get to more senior levels. So that's a point here. This is actually the slide that I have up here. It's some, it's some fairly deep dated research. It's from several years ago, but it's been replicated a number of times. And what it shows is that um, the majority of your high performers are not truly high potentials. They're well-placed or have limited career mobility, career advancement potential. Um, it also shows that virtually all of your high potentials are high performers. And in fact, we could say, why would anybody who has high potential not be a high performer? Isn't high performance part of the criteria for, for potential? And you could make that case. I would say that unless there's something um, inhibiting them in the environment, they're, maybe they're in an untenable situation, or they're so new to their role they haven't had time to demonstrate performance yet, um, high potentials, you could say, universally are high performers. And in fact, the way I, I like to think of it is that Potential is really driving the vehicle, and performance is along for the ride. It's a passenger in the vehicle. Uh, so performance is along for the ride. The point here is, though, that we, we put too much emphasis on performance in hiring and promoting and in identifying people for uh, developmental opportunities and things like that. And so it's very important for us then to separate out these constructs. So let's, let's try to do that. Let's try to separate performance and potential and talk about what those things are. So I have a model here. Uh, this actually comes from Corn Ferry. They're not using it currently anymore, uh, but I like this model because it's, it's a pretty simple model, and it shows some elements that kind of go into comprise potential. And so the first element in the model is called raw material or the right stuff. And what this really says is that uh, there, are, there are a number of uh, characteristics or criteria that, that are we can consider them to be price of admission elements for potential. And the number one thing is cognitive capability. If you want to call it IQ or intellectual horsepower or whatever you want, but there's significant body of research around this that says that <clears throat> the most shared variance between top performers and top leaders is the thing, one thing that they have in common is they're brighter than average. We don't promote stupid people. 
And it takes a certain degree of intellectual horsepower or cognitive capability to deal with the complexities of the world uh, that exists at senior levels in our organizations. So that's a price of admission. You've got to have the intellectual capability, cognitive capability to, to perform well. The second thing on the list is emotional intelligence. It's, it's labeled there as EQ. Emotional intelligence is the ability to uh, not only be aware of my own emotions, um, but be aware of the impact I'm having on other people and then being able to um, kind of control or mitigate my emotional responses so that I can optimize relationships. Now there are, there are some uh, research studies that would say that EQ may be the number one predictor of leadership potential or leadership success, but the preponderance of ev evidence doesn't support that it's the number one. Um, my own personal point of view on this is that uh, emotional intelligence is more a predictor of derailment when you don't have it. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> you, can, you can be quite effective as a leader at senior levels um, and not be uh, Dr. Phil, so to speak, or, 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 or be um, uh, outstanding in emotional intelligence. As long as you're not destroying relationships and burning bridges and, and you're, you get along reasonably well with other people, you can be quite effective. But if you lack those things, you are almost certain to hit a, a ceiling in your career or derail in your career if you can't maintain relationships. So EQ is, a, is an important factor here. Another thing that's a price of admission would be just uh, motivation, uh, energy, drive, career ambition, whatever you want to call it. It's a price of admission. And finally, and, and let me say that those, those first three things there are universal. So in your organizations and every organization you're going to encounter, your high potentials are going to have cognitive capability, they're going to get along reasonably well with other people, and they're going to be highly motivated. Those are our universal price of admission. The fourth element there is cultural fit and, and certain personality traits. And I would say that those things can vary from one organization to another. So you can be a high potential in one organization, but be rejected by another organization uh, because you don't fit with that organization. Uh, the second element that we have here is competency building experiences. And so competencies are uh, knowledge, skills, and behaviors that contribute to my success on the job they can be measured and observed, and they can be learned. The thing about it is um, you can't really separate competencies from experiences because we really only develop competencies through experience. And so the, the quality of experiences and the variety of experiences that I have in, in my career are going to uh, contribute to my potential, contribute to my success, and that should be pretty intuitively obvious. And, and if I have time, I'm gonna wanna talk a little bit more about these type of experiences. For right now, I would say this, that uh, again, uh, you can't separate competencies from experiences, and there's implications for this for succession planning and how we deploy people into jobs, because the primary way that we develop people is by putting them into jobs that stretch them and give them opportunities to learn competencies that they don't currently have. Uh, so succession planning isn't replacement planning. Succession planning isn't saying who's best suited to do this job. Um, because they're, they're already qualified and capable of doing it. Succession planning balances that, the, serving the needs of the business, with developing our talent pipeline. And so there's a kind of a paradox here. Um, uh, on one hand, I want to put people who are fully capable into jobs to make sure the business runs effectively. On the other hand, if I only put people into jobs that they're, current, that they're fully capable of doing, there's little or no development that occurs in that. And so there, there's just this balancing act that we go on, and that's kind of the magic of talent management, is being able to take the right kind of risk and put people into jobs that are going to stretch them and give them the opportunities to do things that they can't currently do. Um, and so that's an un uncomfortable decision to make, but it's necessary if we want to build talent. Okay, so uh, moving on then, the, the next element is uh, something called learning agility. And this is a, this is a real dif differentiator. And uh, uh, it is a type of a competency, but it's too big to be called a competency. So if we go back to that first uh, column of raw material, we have something there called emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is uh, what I would call a meta competency. 
Uh, it's too big to be called a competency. There's a lot of elements that go into it. So there's dealing with conf conflict. There's uh, the, the ability to um, be, be self-aware, to manage my emotions, to read the emotions of other people, <clears throat> to listen, to empathize. So, so there's a lot of elements of emotional intelligence. And likewise with learning agility, it's a meta competency that's highly predictive of leadership potential. So I want to I want to drill into that construct a little bit because perhaps more than anything else, this one is going to be a, a, one of the most useful constructs to have have kind of in your toolbox for thinking about how to identify true high potentials. Who are your authentic high potentials? So uh, just summarizing here, what I would say is that um, so the predictors of leadership potential are general cognitive capability, the energy and drive and ambition, career ambition, uh, competencies that primarily come through experiences, and then personality traits. And emotional intelligence and learning agility are strongly driven by personality. So uh, I won't get into the debate whether or not you can develop personality, but there are some, some personality characteristics that are much more likely to be predictive of leadership success. For instance, uh, the the a learning orientation, ability to, our willingness to take risks in order to learn something new, curiosity, having a broad perspective, being self-aware, uh, being resilient. Uh, these are all personality characteristics that predict leadership success. So personality, uh, some people would say personality is the number one driver and predictor. And uh, when you consider that it includes emotional intelligence and learning agility, and there's a personality characteristic to virtually all of our competencies and including our energy and drive, right? Um, then personality is a very, very important thing to understand. Um, that, and it also determines to a large extent your cultural fit. Okay, so uh, this, this is a definition of high potential. It actually uh, comes from one of my clients. I've sanitized it to remove the company's name, but I was doing a workshop with senior leaders in an organization. <coughs> Excuse me, and I asked them, how do you define potential in your organization or how do you identify your high potentials? And they, their answer was, well, we don't really know. We don't really have a good definition of that. So we developed this. And I won't take time to read it, but you can see that it reflects a lot of the things we've talked about. Uh, it does uh, refer to their core values uh, so that uh, that, that would imply that there's cultural fit involved. But then we have uh, intellectual horsepower, um, we have the emotional intelligence, we have the ambition, uh, we have the uh, key competencies that come through experiences, and finally we have learning agility. So let's drill down into this construct of learning agility and learn more about that. Again, I think this is going to be one of the most useful things to have. So what is learning agility? What roles is it most critical for and what are the components of learning agility? I have a picture up here of Richard Branson who kind of epitomizes learning agility. So let's, de let's define learning agility. Uh, here is the kind of the textbook definition of learning agility. The ability and willingness to learn lessons from experience and apply those lessons to new situations. So that sounds very simple on the surface. It sounds like it's a very simple thing. That's basically the ability to transfer what I've learned in one situation to a unique, new, challenging situation. And that is the definition. But when we study people who do this, we find out, find out that there are are a whole raft of personality characteristics and behaviors and skills that they have that enable them to do this. And this is not, this is actually a very strongly uh, supported construct from research. We've been researching this construct for 30 or more years. Um, there's a large body of research behind it. And what I would say is this, um, and it's highlighted in yellow there, that of all the things we've talked about, including cognitive capability, even motivation, and so forth, that if you can only know one thing to predict who's going to be successful, when somebody is going into a, a, a new kind of a situation, something that they haven't faced before, a new challenge the situation, that might include, for instance, an international assignment. If you wanted to say, what's going to predict somebody's ability to be successful in an international assignment? They've never done any, they've never operated outside their home country, they haven't dealt with other cultures, they haven't uh, dealt with the kind of challenges they face in an international assignment. If you can only know one thing, learning agility will be the single uh, best predictor of, of success in those things. So uh, learning agility uh, is highly correlated with um, the 
progression through a career. So the, the advancement, the, the rate of advancement, the lack of derailment, proximity to the CEO, compensation, performance ratings, almost any um, you know, key performance indicator or key metric that you'd want to uh, use to uh, describe leadership effectiveness, learning agility is highly correlated with that. So let's learn a little bit more about this construct and, and what it goes into to make it work. We, we actually, again, although it sounds very simple on the surface, it sounds like it's just adaptability or ability to transfer what I've learned. There's actually a lot of things that go into it. And so we studied and know a lot about this construct. We, we have a, a five-factor model. And so I want to briefly describe these factors to you. Um, and, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll move along and look at... Um, where this is actually really comes into play and what kind of roles this is most important for. So the first factor is called mental agility. Mental agility is uh, an, an approach behavior towards complexity. Um, so people that are high in mental agility, they don't shy away from complexity. They're highly curious. They take a broad perspective. They, they have a, a learning orientation and are willing to take risks and risk, and for, for instance, embarrassing to ask the, the, the potentially embarrassing question because they don't know the answer to the question. They, they are highly learning oriented and again, take a broad perspective, highly curious. People agility uh, uh, actually it includes a lot of what's included in emotional intelligence. And if you actually, if you take people agility and self-awareness, the fifth factor there, you've, you've embodied a lot of what's contained in the construct of emotional intelligence. So people agility is the ability for me to uh, understand my own motives and behaviors and the impact I'm having on other people, to read my impact on other people, to modify my behavior and my messaging to other people so that I can optimize relationships. So people agility is about building relationships and connecting with people. And, and what you see with people who are high in people agility is that they're comfortable with a wide range of audiences in delivering their messages. And we've all worked with leaders who are, are, are very um, good in the boardroom, are very good uh, with, in a senior leadership meeting, but they seem stiff and awkward when they're when they're out on the shop floor or in the employee cafeteria um, and working with first line employees. They, get, they, they feel a little bit out of their comfort zone. On the other hand, we've all probably worked with leaders who are very comfortable uh, in changing their messaging, their demeanor, and the way they connect with people with a wide range of audiences. And that's really a, kind of a hallmark of people who are, who are good at people agility. Change agility. Uh, and, and by the way, let me say um, that mental agility is not the same as IQ. So uh, Richard Branson, for instance, um, was considered learning disabled and would not probably score uh, particularly well in a traditional IQ test, but scores very, very high in mental agility, highly curious, takes a broad perspective, risk-oriented, and so forth. Um, so I wanted to point that out because mental agility is often confused with, with IQ or, or general cognitive capability. Change agility is another one that's often confused. Um, by people who think that it's just about people uh, who can accept change or tolerate change. Uh, it's much more than that. People who are, people who are high in change agility basically uh, are highly dissatisfied with the status quo. So they're always pushing um, to, to improve, to change. They are, again, uh, like those taking risk um, for, to learn new things, they're taking risk in order to change and enhance things. So there's, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, risk orientation with change agility. People that are high in change agility are, are willing to take the heat of change and the opposition of change. They'll step forward, they're the first to volunteer, they're early adopters. And um, if, I, if I was to point out, uh, two of these factors that are probably most likely to indicate chance of derailment in a career, it would be people agility and change agility. If you as a leader do not have people agility and change agility, um, th then your career is likely at some point to be at risk because you're going to need to be able to drive change in, in your organizations and you do have to build relationships and maintain relationships. Results agility, another thing that, that's maybe not intuitively obvious from what it what their title is, because it's more than just drive for results. Um, there certainly is an achievement orientation included in results agility, but this is very context specific. And what results agility is about is um, how do I behave and what is my demeanor when I'm in a very tough situation? 
So when I'm in a situation that causes other people to panic or to freeze up, um, do I maintain a sense of optimism? Do I, do I, do I exhibit resilience? Um, and people that are high in resilience agility are the kind of people you want to turn around situations and when you have a crisis because they tend to bring, bring their best game. They're actually energized by those challenges that tend to paralyze other people. And so that's, that's part of this learning agility construct. And the final one is pretty self, uh, probably intuitively obvious, self-awareness is uh, exactly what it, the name implies. It's um, when, when my view, the view of myself, how I see myself, largely mirrors how other people see me, that would indicate a high degree of self-awareness. When I see myself differently than other people see me, that shows a lack of self-awareness. Um, so it's, it's understanding my reputation and how I'm perceived by other people. Okay, so where, where does learning agility really come in uh, to play? Um, so here's a simple model that would indicate uh, that as you move from a specialist role, I'm looking at the x-axis down here, as you move from a specialist role to the right to a generalist role, um, the benefit of learning agility increases. The need for learning agility increases. All jobs require some degree of learning agility, the ability to transfer what I've learned, just like all jobs require some degree of intelligence. But some jobs require a lot more intelligence than others. Some jobs require a lot more learning agility than others. So a general manager role, when you get up into the roles where you're managing multiple functions and, and so forth, uh, the, the need to transfer what I've learned and to be adaptive and to have all those characteristics that come through learning agility increase in importance. Also, we can say in general terms on the y-axis, as I move up in the organization, the roles are likely to become more volatile. That VUCA acronym stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And roles become that way as we move up in an organization. There's more pressure to perform. I need to take a longer term view. I need to have a broader perspective. And all those things are enabled by learning agility. So one of the things that I think is uh, important to, to see from this is that well, first to recognize that learning agility is strongly um, influenced by personality. So that would imply that it's difficult to develop, and indeed it is. It is a difficult meta competency to develop. But if we take somebody down here that's in the southwest corner, and I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, but I'm pointing down to the lower left-hand corner, the individual contributor specialist. We all start off our career as specialists, or most of us start off as a specialist as an individual contributor. But if I have all the right stuff to be a high potential, so I'm bright, I get along reasonably well with people, I'm very highly motivated and so forth, then that would indicate a degree of potential to move faster than other people and to move to higher position levels. But notice that um, it's... Because jobs pick us, we don't necessarily pick jobs, I get attracted to certain kinds of roles. And if I'm attracted to a role based on my aptitude and personality that has to do with precision, analysis, avoidance of risk, so typical roles in finance, roles in IT, um, roles in all of the, what we call the STEM disciplines, so the science, technology, engineering, and so forth, those kind of roles tend to attract people that have a learning agility deficit. They, they typically, by personality, are not oriented towards learning agility. And yet, if they're going to go to senior levels in your firm, they need to, they're going to benefit from learning agility. So it's really important that we identify those people early in their career, the people that have all the right stuff, and start them on the track to developing learning agility. So as they move up in the organization, they're going to, to be supported by that construct of learning agility. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I know I'm racing through this stuff pretty quickly, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to just uh, give you a few more points and then we're going we're gonna to have some time for questions. So to be clear, learning agility is a construct that's highly predictive of, of leadership potential. It supports all the other things that are more easily understood and intuitively identified by managers. So we, we tend to be pretty good at identifying who's bright, who's smart. In fact, as soon as you open your mouth in a meeting and start speaking, other people are gauging your level of intellectual horsepower, right? So we kind of, our brain kind of does that for us. We kind of identify intellectual capability in other people naturally. We can usually spot drive, motivation, and drive and career ambition in people. That becomes pretty intuitively obvious. Um, we can analyze and review people's experiences and look at their performance. And you can't perform if you're not competent, so we can make inferences about people's competency. So if we start looking at the elements that predict performance, our potential, um, 
we can say that a lot of them we should be able to identify. As long as we can separate in our mind, in our mind that <clears throat> performance and potential are two different things. But the, the one thing that's, that's less understood and not easily identified by our leaders is this construct of learning agility. So this is a very important construct to kind of educate people on. Not only the managers that are making decisions to identify talent, but also for our early career people so that they understand what this construct is, so they, they can become aware of it and start looking for opportunities to get outside their comfort zone, which is the primary way we develop in anything, but particularly learning agility. It's about identifying the boundaries of my comfort zone and getting outside my comfort zone so I can become comfortable with what was previously uncomfortable. Um, so that's how we develop this. Uh, it is possible to be an effective leader and not be particularly high in learning agility, but uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a basketball player. We'd say that um, there are some tall people who are not good in basketball, and there are some short people who are really good in basketball. And learning agility is like that. But most basketball players are tall, and we know that height benefits basketball players. And if I'm in a role that's a, a generalist kind of a role, or I'm a senior level in an organization, Having learning agility is going to be a great enabler and predictor of success. Okay, so um, <clears throat> again, this is just to kind of reinforces what I said earlier about competencies. Um, you can't separate deployment and development. Um, so we, de we develop people by deploying them into jobs that are going to get them outside of their comfort zone and give them the opportunity to transfer what they've learned in a previous situation to a new situation. And uh, so this is a model, 70-20-10 is a model that probably many of you have heard of. But it also comes into play when we consider about career paths. So I want to talk to you just briefly about career paths. And I mentioned that the, the people that are on a technical path. Um, so we can, we can actually call, we can identify these two cohorts of people, or target populations, pools of talent, high potential generalists and high potential specialists, what some people call high professionals. Both of these, tar these populations are, have all the right stuff for potential, but their career paths are fundamentally different. The high professional or the high potential specialist stays in a fairly narrow career path. So they're, they're in finance, they're going to stay in finance for their whole career, but if they have high potential, they're going to end up as a chief financial officer. If they're in IT, they're likely to stay in IT and develop deep expertise in that. But if they have potential, they can rise to those senior levels and be the chief information officer or chief technology officer, for instance. So why is it important to understand these two things? Um, from a talent management perspective, these two career paths are, are fundamentally different. And the way we, we deploy people into jobs is different. The way we engage these people and the way we brand and retain people in these career paths is different. So, um, I'll just give you a few implications of that um, before we kind of wrap up and get to some questions. But so again, there are these two talent pools, high potential generalists and high potential specialists or high professionals if you prefer, are important cohorts of talent to identify because we want to, we want to differentiate talent and treat them differently. We need to do that to develop them. There is a third pool of talent that's very important. So although we care about all of our talent, our general employee talent, uh, our general, general employee population, we need to engage them and develop them. Obviously, they, they're on our payroll because they add value and we care about those people, but we need to give special attention <clears throat> to our high potentials. And they're the early career high potentials. Those are what I call emerging talent. That's another talent pool that's very important to identify. Because learning agility is hard to develop, we can't wait until people are 45 years of age to say, okay, we need to develop this person for the CEO role. Uh, typically, when you interview senior executives and you ask them about the, the jobs they've had in a career that have made a meaningful difference for them developmentally, they'll identify somewhere around eight jobs that people have in their career that enable them, that they learn things in those jobs that they wouldn't have learned in another role that enabled them to get to where they are. And even on a fast track, we're talking about high potentials here. Even on a fast track, we're, we're, we need high potentials to remain in their jobs typically two to three years. Uh, let's say if two and a half years might be kind of an average number. And if you do the math, eight times two and a half is 20 years to build a senior executive, to give them the right kind of jobs. And that's if everything lines up and you're making really good decisions and putting them into meaningful developmental roles. So. Uh, we need to be proactive and hands-on with talent and identify emerging talent early so we can, we can find out are they, are they 
do they belong on a generalist path or should they stay on a specialist path? And, and, and uh, we can kind of validate their potential by stretching them and putting them into those roles. So those are three talent pools that it's very important to serve. High potential generalists, high potential specialists, and emerging talent, early career people. Uh, one of the differences between the career paths of your specialists and your generalists is that although they both go to senior levels, kind of the altitude in the career, they're destined for that, and they move faster than the general employee population, the, the, what's represented by the, the line that kind of curves around the mountain here is this, the generalist. It's a more of a circuitous path, which means that, um, that they can move through jobs more rapidly and they're likely to have more jobs because there are more jobs available for, to put them into, to stretch them, to deploy them, because they are generalists. So we, can, we have a, a wider variety of lateral moves open and so forth. But if we're on a specialist path, and I'm in finance, for instance, I'll just pick on that as a discipline. Um, if I'm in finance, there's only a limited number of roles I can go, go into that are going to be highly developmental and stretching that are significantly different one role from another. And so that actually presents a unique problem problem for people in talent management and for developing careers because we can't afford people to become disengaged or become bored or to lose developmental opportunities so we need to be constantly stretching people in their roles and so that presents a challenge because the people that are on the specialist path may be in their role, role four or five years versus two and a half years for the the, the generalist and so we need to, to, to uh, be creative in stretching them giving them what we call develop and place assignments that would um, leave them in their current role, but give them extracurricular things to serve on task forces, cross-functional teams, and other kinds of things that are going to stretch them and give them experiences, develop competencies, and perspectives on the business. Okay, so boy, I've been racing through this stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of conclude just with one slide here, um, and uh, just focus in on one thing here, uh, and that is uh, in terms of your own personal effectiveness. One of the things that we want is that's we know is an engagement driver for high potentials. So the things that engage your high potentials are pretty much the same things that engage your general employee population. They want development opportunities. They want to trust their senior leadership. They want to have a sense of purpose in the organization. They want to be paid fairly and so forth. And we know what those drivers are. But some things are more important to high potentials uh, than, than the general employee population. And one of them is this thing around personal influence. Um, you're, you and your high potentials want to have a voice. They want to know that their opinions are heard. And for high potentials, that's just, that's not an option. If they're not, they're not in, a, in a place where they feel like they're having some, at least the ability to be heard and have their opinions matter, then they're going to go someplace where they do matter. There's actually only two ways to retain your high potentials. You can either bribe them or you can engage them. And so we need to know what engages them and uh, the opportunity to be challenged, to avoid boredom, uh, uh, opportunities for growth and opportunities to be influential are primary drivers for your high potentials. In order to be influential, uh, there's probably three things that you need. You need to have credibility, uh, so you need to understand your business and your, your discipline and the industry that you operate in so that you're, you have credibility. You also have to have access to people who matter because if you don't have access to people who matter, you can't be very influential. And so giving um, access to your high potentials, especially your emerging talent, your early career people, um, providing their opportunities to, to interact with people who matter. And what I mean by that is people who are, who are influential already in the organization and the senior levels is very important. The third um, nece uh, necessary element for being influential is, I believe, you need to have your, a unique point of view. You need to have something different to say. If you don't have something different to say, there's really no reason for anybody to listen to you. And, and so helping your, your uh, early career high potentials uh, understand how to develop influence will greatly enhance their career and be highly engaging for them. So, okay, so I think uh, we've got about 20 minutes left in this thing and uh, you know I could have spoken at length about any of the, the, the points that I talked about but I want to give time for questions here so let me see if we have some questions and if you'd like me to drill back into any of the things that I've mentioned so far. Thank you so much Kim. If you'd like to ask him a question you can type your question up into the question chat area and I'll read that out loud for you. And with that we have a first question. 
if learning agility is so strongly driven by personality, can it really be developed? Uh, that, that is a great question because most psychologists would say that personality is a set of fixed traits and is, and can't, and is really not something that you can develop, develop. So here's how I'd answer the question. Um, if we consider personality to be my reputation, how people predict that I'm going to behave in a certain context. So if you know me and, and you were asked to define my personality, you'd say, well, Kim is, uh, maybe you'd say he's very approachable or not, or uh, he's, he uh, deals with conflict very well or not. And you would, might be, think about how I behaved in certain uh, situations and my typical behaviors um, would be driven out of my values and, and the, my assumptions about how the way the world works. And so my reputation then becomes my, uh, my personality. Now what I can change, although I might not be able to change my, my underlying traits and my uh, underlying preferences, what I can do is I can change my tolerance for things. And that's what I mean when I get to talk about getting outside your comfort zone. So as an example, let me, let me give this example. As a kid, like most kids, I didn't like green vegetables, and I particularly hated broccoli. And if I walked in the house and I smelled my mom was cooking broccoli, I would run out of the house, and you know I couldn't stand it. Eventually, I learned if I smothered broccoli with enough cheese, I could tolerate it and began to even like it with a lot of cheese on it. Then I could learn learn to eat it raw, and now I can eat steamed broccoli. Is it my favorite thing? No, but my tolerance for it has changed. My, my I can, you could say that my preferences have changed, and that's really what learning agility is about. It's a it's about becoming comfortable with what was previously uncomfortable. And so our performance is better. We do well um, with things that we like and that we're good at. And so um, I'm comfortable when I'm doing something I'm good at, I'm good at it. And so getting comfortable is also about getting good at things. So if we're talking about dealing with ambiguity, uh, leading change, dealing in a turnaround situation, dealing with crisis situations, until I get myself outside of my comfort zone and I operate in those kind of situations, I can't develop a tolerance for those things. So whether or not the personality is changing, I think that's another debate. But what I can say is that learning agility with the right kind of motive and the right kind of opportunities to get outside my comfort zone can certainly be developed. Thank you. The next question is from Coogan. What if an employee has all the qualities of the high potential candidate? but the management or the leadership in his or her company does not have the capability to recognize this and the employee is overlooked compared to those who promote themselves artificially knowing the lack of competence of the management slash leadership of the yeah. company. Is there yeah. a way to alert the leadership in these situations? Yeah, that is an excellent question, and, and this is a, a, a problem that many, many organizations have. You know, there's actually, uh, it's actually a, a fairly small number in terms of percentages of organizations that really understand this stuff and do it particularly well. And those companies basically grow the leaders for the rest of the world. If you look around the world and say, where do the CEOs come from? Many of them have had tenure early in their careers in the Procter and Gamble's, the General Electric's, the Pepsi's of the world, Johnson and Johnson, and I could name other companies. These are companies that kind of un intuitively understand talent management. They educate their line managers, their operational managers to be able to spot talent. And so they kind of avoid a lot of those issues. Uh, so uh, this, the, the answer to this question is, is, is fairly complex, but let me just give you my number one suggestion. That is, you need, to, you need to facilitate rigorous, robust talent reviews of people, uh, of your talent, because that is, a, is not only a vehicle for understanding my inventory of talent and making key to strategic decisions to, to deploy people into jobs, but it is the primary vehicle for educating managers. Um, someone in the organization has to has to be an educator on this stuff. And if, and if you don't have the sophistication or savvy around talent management and the ability to, to distinguish and differentiate between performance and potential, somehow you have to, to create that sophistication. You have, to, you have to create that savvy in the organization. So somebody needs to get it and be an educator. And the ideal person to do that would be the person who facilitates your talent reviews. If you have uh, rigorous, robust, uh, regularly scheduled talent reviews, then you're having meaningful conversations around talent 
uh, with those very managers who struggle with the, with these these kind of issues, and it's an opportunity for them to learn. Eventually, it, they 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 begin to get it. They begin to understand it. So that's that's the number one suggestion I would have would be to uh, facilitate uh, rigorous, robust talent reviews uh, with a facilitator who knows how to educate people in the process. Thank you. The next question is from Marco. Which companies are using this approach to ID and promote talent? Oh, okay. Well, I, I just mentioned some. Um, so the, the one, the big companies that we would all know, uh, General Electric, Pepsi, uh, Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson, and actually, uh, there, there's been a study done by the Hewitt organization. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing it, but for a number of years, every every year or every other year, they would they would publish a report called the top 20 companies, the top top 20 organizations for developing leaders. And if you look at that list of companies, th those are the companies that are basically the academy companies for the rest of the world. They're 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 growing talent. They have a rich, uh, strong bench strength of talent and so much so that uh, other companies um, are, are benefiting from that because they're developing leaders that, that end up going on and being leaders of other, at other organizations. So I've just named a few of them. Um, you know, th there, are, there are many others that are getting this. Um, there was a recent study done by the Talent Management Alliance and uh, seven, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was around 70% of the organizations that were surveyed by this, which included several hundred companies, 70% of them had embraced learning agility as a key predictor of leadership success. I would also say that the U.S. military, uh, Corn Ferry has worked with the U.S. military at the, at the uh, academies. So for instance, uh, West Point Academy, the Marine Corps, the Navy, uh, the branches of the, uh, the armed forces have recognized that because the theaters of warfare have become so volatile and uncertain and amb ambiguous, in fact, VUCA, that term VUCA is a military term, that they, they, they use that to identify the, the modern theaters of warfare, and that our, our leaders on the battlefield need to have learning agility, and so they've incorporated that into their leadership development uh, program. So uh, it's, it's very widely embraced, and there's a lot of research going on. It's just not a corn fairy construct, by the way. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Rosario. You mentioned that cognitive capabilities and motivation can be easily spotted, but not learning agility. Then, how can you spot or measure learning agility when evaluating new external candidates to hire? Uh, yeah, there, there's a, there's a two ways to do that. Primarily, two ways to do that. Uh, you can. There are psychometrically valid assessments. So, for instance, uh, one assessment that I use very, very frequently. It's it's a, an assessment that when I was at Corn Ferry, my team uh, developed an assessment called Via Edge. It's a very simple assessment. It takes about 20 minutes to complete. It's a self-assessment, and it gives you a score in each of those five factors uh, and an overall learning agility score. And that can be administered to external candidates. In fact, I have I have um, uh, a number of clients that are using that extensively for. Uh, not not as the initial screening, but once people get through the initial resume screening, and perhaps even after the first interview, they will they will uh, run the fr their final candidates through that assessment to validate that. So that's one thing you can actually do psychometrically valid testing of people. The other thing is there are interview protocols that would allow you to um, ask behavioral based, structured behavioral based interview questions that would help en enable you to. Um, make an assessment of learning agility. And so I, I, there's also a tool for that called learning from experience, which is an interview protocol. So those are the two methods that I've used extensively. Once you really understand the construct and you've worked with it, um, you, 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 it's much easier to kind of recognize it in other people. So I'd say that that's the companies that have this ability um, developed to a significant degree don't necessarily need to use assessments or to have a formal interview protocol, but because they're savvy about that, they're, they're more attuned to it and, and, and ready to recognize it. Thank you. The next question is from Betty. Can you speak about how you measure potential success for an expat role for a HIPPO, HIPO? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a great question. Well, I think the research would say that the, the number one derailer of uh, expat assignments is family issues. And, and those of you on this call can probably uh, validate that. But that, from the research, that's what I've seen as the number one derailer. So that, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. And it's, and it's 
uh, fraught with political sensitivities, right? Because uh, if you're making decisions based on, um, you know, marital status or family situations, that can become a problem um, from a kind of a political and even legal situation. But we know that that is a, a significant thing. So, so beyond that, uh, I, I would say the willingness and motivation of the person to uh, embrace the assignment and then learning agility are are if they're if they're highly motivated and they're strong in learning agility and uh, then they're probably going to be a good candidate for an expat assignment. I don't know if that answers the question. But I hope so. Okay, and there was a second part to this one also. Can you speak about how this hippo leadership construct translates across cultures? Oh, good, 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 good question. Um, well, as most constructs uh, that we know from talent management that are supported by research, um, we see we see that there's a lot of transferability. There are some significant things around learning agility, primarily in Asian cultures with change agility. So, if you're assessing people uh, from from uh, an Asian culture, um, they may just from a cultural standpoint um, in, uh, exhibit uh, less of a tendency to be change agile. They let their more risk avoidance and um, they would score higher on the personality characteristics in terms of dutifulness and prudence. Um, one of the things we see about learning, people that are high in learning agility is they tend to be a little bit of a rebel. Um, they tend to be a little bit of a renegade. They're, they're, they kind of push the envelope. They're, they're more likely to break the rules uh, or, or at least push the boundaries of things. And so some cultures that is really not acceptable to do that kind of thing. So I, I think having an understanding of that and being sensitive to that is important. But um, my, my big, personally, one of my biggest clients is based in Hong Kong. And uh, they have 30,000 employees in China. And uh, they, use, they use the Via Edge assessment and learning agility extensively. So I know it can work in, in those uh, uh, kind of cultural situations, but I think being sensitive to that and, and, and just, just uh, being aware that there may be issues related to that is important. Thank you. Um, what's the best way to develop your high potentials? Are there best practices? Uh, yeah, there are some some best practices. Again, this is a really big question. So let me just start with emerging talent. Um, the first thing, most companies don't do a very good job of identifying their emerging talent. They wait too long. They, they wait until people are mid-career before they really identify them as a high potential or, or take make aggressive developmental action uh, with people. So I would say first thing is to start early and test the waters with people. One of the things about people, <clears throat> people are incredibly complex and they will always disappoint you or delight you, one of the two things. And so early career people, we have an indication that they have all the right stuff, right? Intellectual capability, motivation, so forth. Um, but we have to test the waters. So we have to get them outside of their comfort zone and explore things. So if if we have a true high potential and we have we have an assignment for them that is going to stretch them significantly and be a risk to their career, the true high potential is likely to embrace that and see that as something that's positive, where, whereas the general employee population, if you propose something to them, they're going to say, why would I want to take on that challenge? There's a chance of failure and so forth. So kind of put uh, aggressively putting people outside their their comfort zone, I think, is important. And that applies across all, all the, the position levels and career position levels. We need to stretch people. But I think early career, we want to be aggressive in testing the waters with people. The other thing is, um, with, and I'll, again, with emerging talent, one of the most important things you can do is set realistic expectations about how careers are built. One of the problems that we have is we have these 25-year-olds uh, that are, you know, just getting their MBA and they come into an organization and they think in five years they're going to be in a corner office. Um, that's not how careers are built. Careers are built by having a series of jobs that often we didn't want. And in fact, I would say this, if you ever find yourself in a job that's unlike anything you've ever done before, a job that you don't want to do, and a job that you're in big trouble if you screw up, thank your, thank your lucky stars because you're going to look back someday on your career and say, that job was a turning point in my career. Virtually every senior executive I've ever talked to can point to these kind of assignments early in their career. They said, I had this job. I didn't want to do it. I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to do it. Um, and if I screwed up, I was going to be in big trouble. But if I hadn't had that job, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so educating emerging talent on that, um, on, on these kind of assignments and 
and um, setting realistic expectations about how careers are built is one of the most valuable you, things you can do for your early career people. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions left. The first one, what percent yeah. of a typical organization's workforce can legitimately be deemed high potential? Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Uh, this is kind of a tricky question because um, it's going to vary from one organization to an, another organization, uh, obviously. There, there's a, a lot of organizations are saying they're doing kind of a forced distribution system. Well, if they're using a nine-cell performance potential matrix, for instance, they'll say, well, we want 20% of our employees to be in cell 7, 8, or 9, or 15%, or 10%, or, or something like that. In my experience, the number, unless you have a very unique organization, your true high potentials, that is the people who can move significantly fast, high velocity, go to senior levels, take on increasingly stretching opportunities, that's a very small percentage and it's almost always less than 5%. Um, that said, you may want to expand the net a little bit to test the waters, especially with your emerging talent. So, so if I'm, if I'm uh, looking at emerging talent, I might want to I might want to try to test the waters with 15% of my employee population, but recognize that most of those are going are going to end up uh, hitting the ceiling in their career or taking themselves out of the running as high potential. Thank you. And the final question: Assuming you can limit false positives and accurately identify high potentials, should you tell them? Uh, okay, that's another thing, that issue of transparency, do we tell high potentials? Um, there's different points of view on this, I'll share you my point of view. Uh, number one is, if you're a true high potential, you don't need to be told, um, you know. Ram Shran, who's someone, an author, a consultant that, that probably many of you on this uh, call, this webinar, know Ram Shran and has read, read his books and articles. I respect him greatly. Um, he, uh, there's a quote from him in one of his books that says, your true high potentials contribute more value than their bosses and typically their boss's boss to their organization. If you're a high potential and you're contributing that much value to the organization, you're going to know that. But So that's one reason and we, we typically, they, they, they know if they're a true high potential, they will know that. But the other thing is that um, we're going to be treating them differently. And so I'm not talking about giving them perks, uh, a, a parking spot or some, you know, nice off-site retreats. I'm talking about giving them challenges that other people don't have. The, the perks and, and the, the things that, that true high potentials get are challenges that other people don't want. And if I'm getting, if, if, if I'm in an organization and I'm being asked to take on jobs that other, that because apparently the organization has trust and confidence in me and they're willing to take a risk with me to put me into this role, that's enough of a message to say I must be viewed as having a significant amount of potential. But it's dangerous, so I, I don't recommend telling people and branding people with an H on their forehead for high potential or an L for loser um, or low potential. Uh, what, what I would say is treat them differently, apply differential treatment, uh, uh, develop them aggressively, be absolutely transparent about your process. So your point of view and philosophy about talent and differentiating talent and your and that yes we have talent reviews we discuss talent in those talent reviews the things that we do is we try to aggressively develop people to whatever they can handle and and so we're sensitive to that we we understand who we have in our talent and what they're capable of and we do our best to match them with with appropriate challenges and that level of transparency I think is very very good if I if I label people I create a sense of uh, entitlement that can be very very dangerous and um, potential is not a lifelong designation a high potential is not a lifelong designation so uh, I think it's dangerous to label people thank you that was the final question Joanna thank you so much Kim that was excellent and by the way Kim is a member of our IERG best practices initiatives committee so I know he's going to be coming back and continuing the conversation thank you very much Kim you're welcome